So all the local officials throughout all the 127 provinces, they help the Jews. And there's this uh, like civil war going on. And the local officials are supporting the Jews because they feared the prime minister, Mordecai. For Mordecai was great in the king's palace and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man, Mordecai became increasingly prominent. Thus the Jews defeated all their enemies with the stroke of the sword, with slaughter and destruction, and did what they pleased with them who hated them. And in Shushan, the citadel, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. Also, it gives the names of the ten sons of Haman, who are Parshan, Datha, Dalphon, Aspatha, Horatha, Adalia, Aridatha, Parmishta, Arisai, uh, Eridai, and uh, the Jezatha. These were the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. They killed those sons, but they did not lay a hand on the plunder. So the Jews didn't plunder, but they did avenge themselves physically in warfare. On the day, the number of, on that day, the number of those who were killed in Shushan, the citadel, was brought to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, The Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the citadel, and the ten sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. Or what is your further request? It shall be done. Then Esther said, If it pleases the king, let it be granted to the Jews who are in Shushan, to do again tomorrow according to today's decree, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. The decree was issued in Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. Now that doesn't seem very nice, but in those days, the danger of reprisals from the, from the uh, offspring of political leaders that had been killed was very great. Uh, we see it in the stories of, of the books of Kings and so forth, that whenever a son is left alive of the, of the previous administration or the previous dynasty, uh, there's a danger that he may find supporters and rise up and try to overthrow the existing dynasty. It was just common practice. It was just political practice that you purge the entire family of those who were the previous uh, people in power so that those, their offspring don't rise up against you later on. Uh, and the Jews who were in Shushan gathered together again on the 14th day of the month of Adar and killed 300 men at Shushan, but they did not lay hand on the plunder. The remainder of the Jews in the king's provinces gathered together and protected their lives. They had rest from their enemies and killed 75,000 of their enemies, I guess throughout the empire, but they did not lay hand on the plunder. This was the 13th day of the month of Adar. And on the 14th day of the month, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Now, again, like I said, I'm not entirely clear on how this was carried out because it's not really, to my mind, made very clear. I may be wrong in saying that it was voluntary of people to rise up. It's possible that Haman had already distributed the money to people who had taken the money in agreement to be hit him. Basically, these people had uh, said, okay, I'll take the money, I'll, I'll kill the Jews in my neighborhood. And if so, those might be the ones who are described as those who hated the Jews. Because it sounds as if the Jews kind of took the initiative in, in attacking those who hated them and killing them. Uh, although I'm not sure that that's what happened here. It, it, the way it's worded it kind of sounds that way to me. That the Jews knew who they were. They knew who the ones were who were contracted to kill them. And they attacked them and killed them uh, preemptively, perhaps. Uh, I'm not really sure how this was carried out. But when it was all over, no one was resisting the Jews in the Persian Empire anymore. And there were more Jews than ever before because many Persians themselves became Jews. By the way, the fact that Persians could become Jews should be instructive to us that throughout history there have been many people who don't have Jewish blood who have become Jews. The Persians had no Jewish blood in them, except the few that may have intermarried with Jews. But by converting to Judaism, they became part of the Jewish community. And of course, intermarried with the Jews. 
And how many times this kind of thing has happened throughout history, nobody knows, except that it's happened a great deal. So that there's been a tremendous admixture of Jewish blood with Gentile blood over the years, and it's very difficult to determine whether there's pure Jewish blood anymore in any family. Um, and, or even what we would consider to be pure Jewish blood. If a person's half Jewish, I mean, they have a Jewish mother and a Gentile father, they're considered Jewish. But they're really only half Jewish. Their daughters are considered Jewish. If they get married to Gentiles, their children will be called Jewish too. But they're only a quarter Jewish by blood. And likewise, the more generations you go down, people will still be called Jewish if they have a Jewish mother. But the Jewish mother might be only one quarter or one eighth or one sixteenth. Jewish by blood, but um, there's been a tremendous dilution, according to scripture and history, of the Jewish race by this kind of thing, people converting to Judaism or marrying Jews. But the Jews who were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day as well as on the 14th day, and on the 15th day of the month they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who dwelt in the unwalled towns celebrated the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day of gladness and feasting, as a holiday, and for sending presents to one another. Now, you might say, how could they be so happy about having just had this bloody conflict? But you have to remember that they were, for about 10 or 11 months, under the shadow of an edict that said they're all going to be exterminated. What, what could they do? They couldn't go anywhere. The whole empire was... The whole, the whole world that was accessible to them was under the Persian rule, and uh, they, there's nowhere to go. It was just they were looking, they were counting the days till they and their children and their wives and their families and their parents all just be wiped out. So this uh, fact that they ended up fighting and killing a lot of people, apparently none of the people they killed were innocent. Um, ugly as that must have been, must have been a tremendous relief to the Jews to have lived for many months under the shadow of a death warrant for no reason other than that they were Jewish. They had done no crimes. I mean, try to picture the situation in our own time. If uh, anybody who had been born to Christian parents, even someone who wasn't choosing to be Christian now, but if they'd been born to Christian parents, there was a, a, an edict that 12 months from now, everyone has got to go turn themselves in to be, you know, killed because they had Christian parents. I mean, that'd be what a weird mentality everyone would be living under who had that particular thing hanging over their head. And if that changed, then of course it would be a great day of celebration. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, to establish among them that they should celebrate yearly the 14th and 15th days of the months of Adar as the days on which the Jews had rest from their enemies, as the month which was turned from sorrow to joy for them, as from morning to a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and joy, of sending presents to one another and gifts to the poor. This feast came to be called Purim. It's a two-day feast that the Jews still celebrate, and this book is there to tell us how and why. So the Jews accepted the custom which they begun as Mordecai had written to them, because Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to annihilate them and had cast Pur, that is lots, uh, to consume them and destroy them. Now Purim, Purim, the name of the feast, is simply plural for Pur. Lot is Pur, and in a Hebrew language you add im at the end to make it plural, so lots. So Purim means lots because that day had been selected by casting lots. But when Esther came before the king and he commanded by letter that this wicked plot be, which Haman had devised against the Jews should return on his own head and that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows. So they called these days Purim, after the name Pur. Therefore, because of all the words of this letter, what they had seen concerning this matter and what had happened to them, the Jews established and imposed it upon themselves and their descendants and all who should join them that without fail they should celebrate these two days every year according to the written instructions and according to the prescribed time that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation every family every province and every city that these days of Purim should not fail to be observed among the Jews 
and that the memory of them should not perish among their descendants. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihail, with Mordecai, the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter about Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdoms of Ahasuerus with words of peace and truth to confirm these days of Purim at their appointed time, as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had prescribed for them, and as they had decreed for themselves and their descendants concerning matters of their fasting and lamenting. So the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book. And thus we have the foundation of that Jewish feast. Now it's interesting about that Jewish feast that uh, the Jews, of course, celebrate it, but it's not one of the feasts that Moses prescribed. The Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Pentecost are all feasts that were ordained by God through God's prophet Moses, the lawgiver. It was a, a, a law given by God that they should keep those festivals. Purim, however, was established simply on human authority, that of Mordecai. Now, Mordecai was a Jew, at least, and a pious one. He was a Jewish leader. But it was established on the authority of the king of Persia with his signet ring on the document. It's rather interesting. And the Jews still celebrate that, although it's a, a holiday that had nothing to do with uh, God's law. In other words, if the Jews did not keep Purim, they would be violating only the Persian king's decree, not God's. Likewise, the Jews today celebrate Hanukkah, which celebrates another event much later in history uh, after the Maccabean War, which happened uh, you know, hundreds of years after this. So the Jews have, in addition to the laws that Moses gave and the festivals uh, that he had on their calendar, other festivals by which they commemorate other events. One thing good about having a holiday that's been kept uh, from earliest times without a break is that, in a sense, it confirms the historicity of, of what they're celebrating because why else would they be celebrating it? Where did Purim come from? Why would it be called that? What did it mean if not this. I mean, Purim has been celebrated by the Jews from that time until this. And although there may be things about this story that seem like, how likely is that, you know? How likely is that that uh, uh, a Jew would become the queen of Persia, and through her intercession, the Jews be saved from an evil man like Haman? I mean, it sounds like a fairy story, but, but one of the things that confirms that it's historically true is that the Jews have celebrated this very story from the time that it happened until now. And if the story didn't happen, what would be the occasion for starting the celebration? You know, it's, it's like the continuous practice of the celebration is a historical confirmation of the events that they're celebrating. Same thing with Passover. Same thing with uh, any, any of these feasts that commemorate some great deliverance, including Hanukkah. These things, why would these feasts be practiced? Why would these holidays still be observed? And why would they have been deserved all, uh, observed all the time if the events that they're celebrating had never happened? What then would originate them? Uh, anyway, the last chapter has only three verses. It says, And King Ahasuerus imposed tribute on the land and on the islands of the sea. Now all the acts of his power and his might and the account of the greatness of Mordecai to which the king advanced him. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second to King Ahasuerus and was uh, great among the Jews and well received by the multitude of his brethren, seeking the good of his people and speaking peace to all his kindred. Uh, it's interesting, it says that uh, the position of Mordecai and all the great position, uh, authority that was given to him is recorded in the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia. Now, the writer of this book lived at a time when those records were apparently available. Perhaps they weren't maybe yet found, although not likely, because unless they were copied as assiduously as the Bible was, uh, the documents would be so thoroughly dilapidated by now that you know they, they certainly wouldn't exist anymore. The only way ancient documents like this ever survive is by people having some motivation to copy them and copy them and copy them over hundreds of years because the copies become old. And this all happened 500 years before Christ or more. And that being so, I mean, even, even documents that were written at the time of Christ, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, 
uh, have barely survived and in very poor condition. Uh, so, you know, the reason we have the Bible is because, although it was written back that long ago, there was someone motivated to keep copies reproduced up until more modern times. But what motive would anyone have for recopying the Chronicles of the Kings of Media and Persia through the centuries, especially after Persia fell and was no longer an important empire? Why would the Greeks keep, you know, copying these Chronicles of the Medes and Persian? You know, these Chronicles are not likely ever to be found, but they certainly existed at one time, and the author knew of them and knew that if people of, of a slightly later time wish to check out the details of this story, you could find it in the Chronicles of the Medes and the Persians. Now, Mordecai here is made out to be the big hero. It's actually Esther who put her life on the line, although Mordecai was very important in the story too, and encouraged her to do it. But this story is a little bit like the story of Joseph in a way. Uh, both Esther and Joseph were ordinary Jews without any political rank in a foreign country. Joseph in Egypt and Esther in Persia. Both of them, through the providence of God, were raised to positions of very high authority, high uh, influence in the pagan world. And both of them were used by God to save their people. Joseph saved his people from a famine, and Esther from extermination. So there's, uh, there's actually a number of details in the story that some people feel uh, are intended to be seen as similar to, uh, to that. You know, for example, uh, Mordecai got his name written down, though he wasn't immediately remembered, by exposing a plot by two servants of the king who wanted to kill him. Uh, Joseph encountered two servants of King Pharaoh in prison. One of them apparently had made a plot to kill the king, uh, and, but it was through Joseph's encounter with them that he was later remembered and brought to authority. So in a sense, both Mordecai and Joseph, through uh, you know, contact with a couple of the king's officials, were later did things that were later remembered and, and had a lot to do with the with their elevation to influence. Anyway, uh, one thing I'd like to say about this also before we're done, and we are essentially done, is that in later centuries, uh, some Jewish writer added a prologue and an epilogue to the book of Esther. This prologue and this epilogue are actually attached to the documents now. Many ancient documents of Esther have these on them. They are what we call apocryphal editions. Just like certain whole books are apocryphal books, like the books of Maccabees or Tobit, which the, actually the, the Roman Catholic Bible includes them as scripture, but Protestants don't recognize them as scripture. They're called apocryphal books. So there's portions of Esther that exist in the Roman Catholic Bible that are not included in the Protestant Bible because they're apocryphal. And the reason they're called apocryphal is they weren't written at the same time. They're not originally part of the book. The book was apparently written in the uh, 5th century B.C., but it was probably in the 2nd century B.C. that the apocryphal prologue and epilogue of Esther were written and attached to it so that it's now part of the documents. But it's written by a different hand. And what's interesting about it is it's written in what we call apocalyptic style. Now, apocalyptic style is that style that the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel and the book of Zechariah are written in. Apocalyptic style was actually a very popular style of writing among the Jews in the first and second centuries BC. And when the book of Revelation was written in the first century AD, it was following a style that was very common and popular among the Jews called apocalyptic. And the apocalyptic writings usually involved dreams and or visions where there were angels and monsters and beasts and dragons and things like that, which were playing out a drama that had symbolic uh, meaning. Now, there is value in noticing these apocalyptic writings from the time bef uh, before Christ because we have a tremendous 
difficulty in interpreting one of our books of the Bible, the book of Revelation, which is written in that style. And as Westerners, we tend to take writings more or less literally. And so Western Christians have tended to take Revelation relatively, uh, I say relatively, really there's tremendous compromise even in this, but somewhat literally, because we do not recognize the style. But one thing about the apocalyptic, apocryphal additions to Esther that is helpful is that we know what the story really was, but we also have the apocalyptic telling of the story in these apocryphal additions to it. I want to read them to you because uh, the prologue that is attached to Esther by this later hand is written in an apocalyptic style, and it professes to be Mordecai writing it. It's another thing about the apocryphal books. They often claim to be written by somebody who didn't write them. But because the writer attached this as an introduction to the book of Esther, he pretended to be Mordecai. And he said at the beginning that he had a dream. Now, in this prologue, we have him relating the dream that he had. And it sounds like something directly out of the book of Revelation because it's a typical apocalyptic style of dream. But then at the end of the book of Esther, he adds a, a, an epilogue at the end, just a paragraph, where he explains the connection of the dream to the story itself. And how this is an advantage to us is that we see exactly how these apocalyptic writers would use imagery to depict ordinary historical events. Let me read this to you. This is how the, the apocryphal prologue to Esther reads. It's, it's uh, Mordecai giving a dream that, he's, that he said he had. It's not really Mordecai. It's a later writer claiming to be him. He says, quote, Behold, noise and confusion... Thunders and earthquake, tumult upon the earth, or tumult. And behold, two great dragons came forward, both ready to fight, and they roared terribly. And at the roaring, every nation prepared for war to fight against the nation of the righteous. And behold, a day of darkness and gloom, tribulation and distress, affliction and great tumult upon the earth. And the whole righteous nation was troubled. They feared the evils that threatened them and were ready to perish. Then they cried to God, and from their cry, as though from a tiny spring there came a great river with abundant water, light came, and the sun rose, and the lowly were exalted and consumed those held in honor. That's the dream. And that is presented as an introduction to the book of Esther. And at the end, we have this epilogue that the same writer adds. After the story is closed, after chapter 10 of Esther, they add this little bit. He says, I remember the dream that I had concerning these matters, and none of them has failed to be fulfilled. The tiny stream, which became a river, and there was light and the sun and abundant water, the river is Esther, whom the king married and made queen. The two dragons are Haman and myself. The nations are those gathered to destroy the name of the Jews, and my nation, this is Israel, who cried out to God and were saved. Unquote. Now, what's interesting about this is there's an actual story, a historical story with ordinary events in it, but the apocryphal dream is written in an apocalyptic style similar to that of Revelation. There's dragons roaring at each other, and all the nations of the world are uh, mobilized, and there's earthquakes, and there's uh, lightnings, and there's thunders, and there's this little river that becomes a great river. And water, I mean, all those are images you find in the book of Revelation, or for that matter, in all the apocalyptic writings of the Jews. There are many apocalyptic writings of the Jews that should not be regarded as, as scripture, and they're not. But they all use this kind of imagery. So when you read the book of Revelation, written in the first century AD, you recognize that the Jews and Christians who are acquainted with this apocalyptic literature would have immediately found the book agreeable with the kind of literature they were used to reading. And of course they would not think of it as literal. Any more than that, you know, Haman and Mordecai were literally dragons, or Esther was literally a little spring that became a river. And so uh, these additions to the book of Esther actually become instructive for us in just understanding how the Jewish mind used apocalyptic imagery to describe events that we actually know the story behind. Um, and so you know, that, that can be helpful to us. And 
warn us to not be overly literal in our approach to other apocalyptic writings, including the book of Revelation. Well, we come to the end of Esther now.